everybody, welcome to week five of our Be Free Bible Study. I hope and trust that God has done amazing things in you and in your group over the past four weeks. Over the past four weeks, you have received a foundation in which to filter life and life circumstances through. We have been, as Jesus said, learning and acquiring truth, and this truth will indeed set us free. But please know that this is just the beginning. It's about to get really good, and I'm excited to move on to this new section called An Overflow of the Heart. For the next four weeks, we're going to talk about what it looks like to release all things to God and give Him permission to intervene in our life. Now, this may, may sound a little bit intimidating, but here is what you're going to find out. The only way to find freedom and live in freedom is to allow God to break through to your heart. So let's get started. I want you to open your Bibles to chapter uh, 4 of Proverbs. We're going to start in verse 20. And in this verse, we're going to find a valuable truth that we will identify, and then we're going to lean into that truth over the next four weeks. Proverbs 4, verse 20 says the following, My son, pay attention to what I say. In other words, this is important. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. That's very important. I want everybody to pause right here. Let's just say that together. Say heart. One, two, three, heart. Your heart, why is that important? For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. So the writer here is saying the key to health and freedom is, is all about truth residing in your heart. He goes on and he says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So notice that God is going to directly address an internal issue here. Notice that he bypasses all the surface level symptoms and goes directly to the root of what is causing us pain and is robbing us of freedom. So he bypasses our mom issues, our dad issues, our ex-husband issues, our ex-wife issues, our past abuse issues, our past sin issues, and he basically says, if you want to be free, if you want to live a life that is full, if you want to embrace and receive all that I have for you, you have to begin not by fixing your symptoms, not by fixing someone else. We have to begin by fixing our heart. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the reason that we're going to focus on the heart is simply this. If the heart is bad, nothing else will be correct. About two years ago, I was in the emergency room with one of my children, um, my daughter, Elliot. And ERs are no fun, especially on the weekend. And uh, I love and respect all who serve God through health care. God bless you. But I do not look forward to seeing you at work and hope I don't have to anytime soon. But on this day, we went in. Uh, we went up to the desk of the emergency room and we told them what was going on. And, and then we waited. And we waited. And we waited. And we waited. And while we waited, several other patients came in and went directly back to the exam room. Now, while I knew what was going on, Elliot didn't. She's nine years old at the time, and she said, why do those people get to go to ahead of us? And I told her, I said, it's simply this. It's because their sickness or their injury is, is, is more critical than yours. I told her, while your issue needs to be addressed, and it will, theirs is life-threatening. And maybe you've experienced the same thing in a doctor's office or an emergency room. Uh, may, maybe someone went ahead of you because their issue took priority. Well, the same is true with our spiritual life and our spiritual well-being. God, our ultimate physician, will always begin with what is most critical. The first thing that he attended to in your life and my life was salvation. You were dying. I was dying. We were on our way to eternal death and separation from God. And your condition, my condition, was critical. And at just the right moment, God stepped in and he saved your life. You were rescued and we should praise him for that every single day. But often after someone is rescued or becomes stable, there's still work that has to be done. Often before a patient can go on to full recovery, other procedures must take place. The same is true with God. According to God's word, the next critical step is giving us a new heart. So what is God referring to when he says our heart? Go to your work workbooks and let's define what the heart is. The heart is simply this. The heart is the center of the physical, mental, and spiritual life of all humans. It is the effective center of who you are. And it is really all that God looks at when he looks at you. In 1 Samuel 16, starting in verse 7, it says, The Lord does not look at things man looks at. Man looks at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Again, why does he do that? Because the key to fixing you 
and getting to where getting you where you need to be is, is past surface level it resides in your heart so if you want to know why you're depressed if you want to know why you often get angry if you don't want to know why um, you're, you're maybe always negative or pessimistic if you want to know why you can't seem to get past that one sin that thing that always gets you the thing always gets the best of you if you want to know why you're going to have to to look past the symptoms. You're going to have to look past the surface level things and look to the heart. So here's what we're going to do with the remaining time that we have together. I'm going to identify the most common spiritual heart diseases, if you will, things that keep us from progressing in the Lord and keep us sick. And then we're going to give a simple solution to ridding your heart of those diseases. And then over the next four weeks, you as a group, you're going to take these four diseases and you're going to unpack them in depth one at a time. So let's go to our workbooks and let's look at the first heart disease. The first most common heart disease is selfishness. It's selfishness. Selfishness is a heart disease that will sabotage your entire life. Selfishness is seeking or concentrating on you and what is best for you. Selfishness uh, seeks self-gratitude it seeks self-pleasure and self-well-being over others. And it sets you up for anger, disappointment, jealousy, and depression when you're not satisfied with what's going on or a certain result. God tells us that if we harbor, and that's a key word, I want you to circle that, if we harbor this disease in our heart, or if we keep it there, it's going to lead to bad things, and it'll keep you from the life that he has for you. He affirms this in James chapter 3. So in your workbooks, verse, starting in verse 14, it says, If you harbor, again, circle that, if you harbor bitter envy or selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth, because such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, it's unspiritual, it's demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, underline that, you will find disorder and every evil practice. So in other words, Selfishness, if not dealt with, will result in disorder and dysfunction. Now, here's the good news about selfishness. Selfishness is not who you are. It is simply something that you have embraced or adopted. You know, go back to that word that James used. James uses the word harbor. He says we harbor selfishness. And to harbor is to anchor a foreign, unstable object like a boat to a secure structure. That's what happens in a harbor. So when you harbor selfishness, you are securing a foreign, unstable thing to a stable, secure part of you, which is your heart. So selfishness is actually, here's what we need to know, it's a spirit. It is a lie that your enemy has led you to embrace. And the good news is this, you have the power and the authority to rule over this spirit in your life. In the name of Jesus, the spirit of selfishness can be gone from your life once and for all. So the key is learning to walk in full surrender. And this week, you're going to learn that. You're going to study what it looks like to walk in a life of surrender. All right, number two in your outline, the second heart disease, if you will, is bitterness. Fill in that blank, bitterness. Now, bitterness is when we hold on to past wounds and we begin to um, resent others because of what they have done to us. So bitterness is a result of not being able or not knowing how to, to release people from offense. And this will be essential uh, if you ever want to move past your past and embrace your future in the Lord, uh, you got to learn how to release others and get past bitterness. So why is that? Well, because in Luke 17, Jesus said that that offense is inevitable. In other words, uh, he said to his disciples, people are going to come against you. People are going to offend you. It's going to happen. And if you don't learn how to release them, you'll never move on. So if you don't deal with offense correctly, you will remain offended. And Proverbs says that if we remain offended, uh, offense is like a, an offended brother is unyielding is what it says. It's more unyielding than a fortified city. Disputes are like the, the, the barred cities of a citadel. So um, basically what the proverb writer is saying here is someone who has offense 
is unyielding, meaning um, they, they can't, nobody can get in. They, they've put up a wall. They've put up a barrier. So nobody can get in and fix the real problem. God can't get in or through to them. Others can't get in or through to them. This offense of the past has created a barrier of bitterness around your heart, and it's keeping all bad things in, and it's keeping all good things out. Again, good news. Bitterness is not who you are. You're not a bitter person. You have chosen to harbor bitterness. But again, the wall of bitterness that is currently surrounding your heart can be destroyed once and for all by God and the power of His Holy Spirit. So how does that happen? Well, the key is learning to walk in forgiveness. So uh, two weeks from now, we're going to see what God's Word says about learning to walk in forgiveness and the power that will be released in your life if you learn how to do that. All right, the third heart disease is rejection. I want you to write that in your outline or in your workbook, rejection. What is rejection? Rejection is a big one that many people face. As a matter of fact, at, at some point we have all met rejection face on. Rejection is the feeling of not being accepted, um, being tossed to the side. Uh, it's a feeling as if you're not loved. And again, I believe all people have been rejected at some point or another. Some people have been rejected by people that are very close to them, and that is that, 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 that inflicts deep wounds in our life. And that rejection has left your heart injured and sick. Um, most of the time, rejection comes in the form of negative words that were said to us, negative words that pierced our hearts and greatly injured us. Maybe we were told something like um, we, we were worthless or that we're no good or that we'll never amount to anything. Um, those are all lies that the devil spoke to you through someone else. And instead of demolishing those lies, what often happens is we embrace them. We begin to believe them. And the spirit of rejection has now set up camp in our hearts. And this spirit can be broken. How? In the same way that it was formed, and that's through words. Look at Proverbs 18, 21. Love this verse. It says, The tongue has the power of life. I want you to circle life and death, underline death. Well, I want you to notice it has both. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So just as negative words have hurt you, positive words, truth-filled words can restore you. Um, the words of God, the truth of God can bring life back to you and can bring life to others. So in week three, three weeks from now, we're going to study and learn about the power of words and how we can use them for good, not for evil. And that's what's coming up in three weeks. All right, last heart disease is evil thoughts. I want you to write that in your workbook, evil thoughts. What are evil thoughts? Evil thoughts are simply a byproduct of what you've been exposed to, but more so, probably this is, this is the case for most of us, it's what we have exposed ourselves to. Evil thoughts are a product of corrupt, worldly influences that we've invited into our life. Um, due to the shows that we watch, the movies that we watch, the music that we listen to, the books that we read, the pictures that we view, the websites that we visit, the social sites that we spend way too much time on, due to these things, our minds have been polluted and our hearts have been damaged. I want you to notice in your workbook what Jesus says in Mark chapter 7. He says, For it is from within and out of a person's heart that evil thoughts Come. So, in other words, he's saying garbage in, garbage out. He says if you allow your mind to pollute your heart, your heart will then pollute your thoughts and desires that do not line up with God. And often those desires lead to temptation. Temptation leads to sin, and sin leads to death. So he goes on and he says, you know, out of your mouth, uh, from your heart comes sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lawlessness, envy, slander, uh, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and they eventually defile a person. So how do you fix this heart disease? It's simple. You replace all the bad thoughts and all the bad influences with good thoughts and good influences. So four weeks from now, we're going to talk about the Word of God and allowing God's Word to influence our lives by changing the way that we think. Paul says, the Apostle Paul says, that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. All right, so that is where we're going over the next four weeks. But what can we do today? 
What can I do right now in preparation for the next few weeks? Well, I'm going to read you a scripture, and then I'm going to give you some steps that you can take today and then discuss in your groups today. I want you to look at Ezekiel 36. We're going to start in verse 26. And this, this, this verse that we're about to read, you must understand, Ezekiel is a prophet. And this is a prophecy, meaning that it has the power to come true in your life. If, if you believe what you're hearing in your heart and you move in faith by your actions, and that's important because all miracles require faith, and all faith requires some type of movement and action. And so this is, this is basically what the prophet is saying, that I will give you a new heart. So let's read that together. I'm going to give you a new heart. How is he going to do that? How is God going to do that? By putting a new spirit in you. He says, I will remove from you your heart of stone, that hard, rigid stone that has walls all around it, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. What does that mean? I'm going to make it soft again, and I will put my spirit in you. And he's talking about his Holy Spirit, and I'm going to move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So in other words, I'm going to give you a helper. I'm going to give you a healer that will change your heart and move you to healing through obedience. And when this process begins, your heart will become pure and you will begin to see God work in your life. Matthew 5, 8, love this verse, says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So what do we need to do today? How can we do that? Four things, and then I'm going to pray for you. Number one, we need to invite the Holy Spirit to show us. I invite the Holy Spirit to show me. Show me, Holy Spirit. We need to pray that God show us what blockages exist in our heart, what diseases exist in our heart, and then give us, we pray that God gives us the grace and the power to move toward the healing that he's offering us. So the first step to healing is admitting that there is a problem that needs to be healed, that needs to be addressed. And it's important to confess that to God. God blesses that confessed need in your life and then goes to work in it immediately. So you need to pray something like this today. God, I have a heart issue, and I need your grace. I need your power, and I need your presence to work in me. Number two, we need to invite the Holy Spirit to change us. Psalms 51.10, this is a prayer from David. I love this prayer. He is, he's fallen to sin, and now he's asking God to do something in him. And here's what he's requesting. He's saying, God, create in me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And we need to do the same thing. We need to pray that our intent is for our hearts to change. And we need to tell God that we are allowing him to go to work in our, our lives. So God, show me. Now God, change me. Now number three, I need to invite the Holy Spirit to fill me. Um, an intimate friendship with God does not happen automatically. According to scripture, and you're going to see this in the weeks to come, after salvation, there's a second experience that God offers all people who want to know him more closely. We see it in the book of Acts when the apostles who already knew Jesus were filled again with his presence in a fresh new way. We have a longing in us to be filled with God's presence. All of us do. And all of us need to ask at him at this point and be open to the fact that he wants to give us more of himself. So all of the stuff that God is taking out of you, all of the bad things, it's got to be replaced with something. And God intended that those empty places be replaced with himself. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. And it could have been wine or any other thing. Basically what the writer is saying here is don't fill your life with bad things. Don't fill those voids with bad things. But instead fill those voids with God and his Holy Spirit. All right, now last, and we're going to say this every week, so you just need to, to get used to this. We're going to say we, did, we need to choose life every day. Holy Spirit, allow me to make life-giving decisions every single day. Deuteronomy says, This day I call on the heaven and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you. God says, I have set before you today life and death, life and death choices, blessings and curses. And here's our, here's his, here is his hope for us. Here is his desire for us. Please choose life. God's hope is that you choose what has been discussed today because these choices will result in the life that he has created you to experience. And that's our hope as well, that we all choose life. Let me pray for you as we close out this video session. God, we thank you so much for your holy word, for your truth, God, that is in the process of setting us all free. 
God, we, we realize today your Holy Spirit has opened our eyes to the fact that we all have heart issues that need to be dealt with. Some of us have a past that we've never dealt with correctly. Some of us, God, we have, we have heart injuries and heart diseases that have never been dealt with correctly. And until our heart is dealt with correctly by you through love and grace and mercy and truth, we'll never be able to go on to the things that you have for us. We'll never be able to experience life as you created us to experience. So God, may, be, may we all be aware of what is bothering us. May we all be aware of these heart diseases and may we all be open to your presence and your Holy Spirit working in our lives. Lead us now in conversation and lead us over the next four weeks to discuss how we can walk close to you, how you can heal our hearts and how we can go on to the great things that you've called us to. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen.